So remember that place, the Davenport? Yeah. Or yeah. well, I guess it's still there, right? I opened it. Oh, yeah, that's right. You did. That's yeah, right. Of course you remember that. Yeah. So the first time I ever went there was probably 2005 or six, maybe. And I remember like the friend I was with, she said, okay, it's like a martini bar. It's kind of nice. Okay, great. I like martinis. I walk in and I go to order my our martini. There's a guy at the bar, old guy at the bar, just sitting there, nice. you know, drinking his, you know, drinking his. It's like it's like you know, five in the afternoon or yeah. whatever on a whatever day it was, Saturday maybe. And it, I look down and he's got this fucking box this big. I, I I'm not kidding, like you know, like this big a box, like a, like a like a tube of toothpaste, you know, like, a, like a toothpaste box. All it says on it, it's red and white. All it says on it is ointment in big letters. Just this random box of ointment on the bar. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What is that? I remember you telling the story. I don't know. Ointment. It's just ointment. Wow. Yeah. I told the story before. Mm-hmm. Oh, God, I'm already I never heard myself. It. Yeah. Maybe well, not on the show. Whatever. Whatever. Maybe, yeah, just yeah. ointment. I stepped away. Yeah. I went around the corner and ordered a... <laughs> Seeing large tubes of ointment make me a little nervous. Yeah. Especially in a bar situation. Who puts that on the bar? Or maybe... He's just being preemptive. Guess he's getting ready for some some crazy Saturday night yeah. at the Davenport. Yeah. Martinis and ointment. Yeah. That's all we got to write. Anyway. Martinis and what? <laughs> martinis and ointment. Oh. Chad missed the beginning part. Separate vessels, of course. For a second, I thought you said martinis and disappointment. Well, that could be. That's that's. <laughs> Sounds like be, the country song we heard That's last like night. every night at the Davenport <laughs> these days. Country. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now... Keep in the Owen country. Chad, what episode is this? <laughs> this is Slappercast episode number 85. 85 and still alive. Yes. And it's the middle of September already. Mm. Believe it or not. Well, we're finally getting that reprieve in the heat. Yeah. yeah. Very nice morning in the last couple of days. Yeah. Yep. Gorgeous. And since we've since we've <laughs> seen you last, we've even we've even rehearsed. We're uh Okay, Looks like I, we're getting. I I I don't mean to interrupt you, but I, I do. You just talk, did. I want to talk. So about, carry on. I, I do mean it. I do mean to interrupt you. That's what people should start yes. saying. I wanted to play whiskey last night. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> but we didn't play it. We rehearsed it. We didn't play it. Come on now. We didn't rehearse it. We did rehearse it. No, well, we did rehearse it. We Three rehearsed of us it, did, but we had a fiddle player that didn't rehearse it. <laughs> so he's clever. He can catch. No, up. he is very that clever. Jeff Duncan. He a is very young clever. Lad. Is that his name? Jeffrey Duncan. Je- oh. Yeah. Oh. Sir Duncan. Hmm. Sir Halifax. Anyway. Anyway. So. We, we did rehearse. Yes. Yeah. So we rehearsed. And I tell you something, that's not like riding a bike. Riding a bike, you go outside and you get, you know, you're, you're on two wheels and you're, you know. This is not like that at all. If we were, I rode a bike right now, I'd have two skin knees. Promise you. Really? Yeah. Hmm. Rehearsing, however, the only thing that gets skin is my pride. Mm. I'm playing those bad notes. Yeah, that was uh, that was that was a lot of bad notes. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it, it's so strange on how you do this for so long, and then you're taken away from it, and it, or it's it's it disappears, and. You come back to, well, I don't remember. I, you know, I just, this is difficult. This the voice is a muscle, your, your vocal cords, you know, they're muscles, and you don't use them, then you got to start they again. Fuck off, yeah. <laughs> and we come back to that and then try, try to, you know, whew, that's something else. So very, uh, you know, we, we've, we've never had time off like this before. Um, only part-time professionals have that kind of mm. oh, segue. That's, um, that's one. <laughs> See how many times it's going to show up in the show today. Yeah. So um, yeah, I mean, really, if you're if you're doing this for a living, if you're full-time professional or AKA professional, <laughs> you know you're, you know you're to to have so such a gap. In your trade, it's just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure it's the same for any, you know, plumber, you know, if they're off for, say, you know, electrician, this, you know, they got to get back into it, you know, and, um, you know, especially if you, I mean, we, we're by no means back to a full schedule, Mm-mm. but uh, I will say that there's 
definitely some, you know, we're getting a lot of calls. So I'm looking to, to get out in the road and head out on the highway. It's funny when you look at this thing as a profession, it's like any other job. At some point you need to take a break, take a week off, vacation, yeah, 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 yeah. two weeks off, whatever. Okay. And, and I find that when it's normally like that, when we're normally playing all the time and we do take a week off or a couple of weeks off, you kind of come back refreshed. You kind of come back energized. Yes. Your brain is a little bit clearer. Um, it gives you the chance to, sometimes it gives you a chance to, if you don't play, um, it gives you a chance to kind of like all of a sudden like new ideas suddenly pop up in your yeah. head because they're not so cluttered. However, taking this much time off, then it becomes more of a, I think like you said about the voice, it becomes more of a physical thing of, of, of uh, trying to, you know, retrain yeah. certain yeah. parts Struggling of vocal memory. cords or, yeah. you know, fingers and hands and fills and stuff like that. Um, it's a little bit more of a challenge than just taking a week or two off. Yeah. But it, it's, it, it's really, it's lit a fire for me to, to, to actually push, put into practice singing on a, on a daily basis to, to, you know, cause you kind of just hum along it, but, when you put three hours of, you know, full voice rehearsing, you know, trying to get back to, man, that was, that was rough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, strange to hear it because we're, you know, we're, we're so in tune now with our, with our in-ears, you know, you're so focused on, you know, doing the right, you know, obviously locking in as a band, but you got to focus in on your own your notes and playing and, just making everything, making it sound as good as you possibly can. But mm. my God, the, the str str uh, I guess the strength it took to stay in that, you know, at, at that level. And then, and then just last night, just passing out, it was absolutely just worn out. Mm -hmm. Just like, I, I, that's been a long time to, that's been a long time since that kind of energy has been expelled. I'm yeah. Like, yeah. That was a solid so, night work. So, yeah. What happened last night? <laughs> big big rehearsal. Remember? <laughs> we played to me. Was that you? I was there. Yeah. I was. Yeah. I have to say too. The, the, the I, we can cut this part out because I don't want any record of this. But I thought, I thought we played really well. I thought we did too. I really did. I was. I was. I loved the sound of the room. We got to. We got to play in a place that we usually don't. But I loved the sound of the room. But I. I, I loved that nobody. I was like, oh, you know, let's just go through. That was. I, I thought a tremendous live performance i just thought did we tape that we did yeah, yeah we'll, we'll have put some, oh lord yeah. yeah we'll have to put some i mean it was just energy was great mm -hmm. from the first note i just thought that the that the the energy was really good it was just lively and it was just yeah you know and it felt but, great yeah <laughs> just doing it again i was like thank god yeah that's it that that was a, it was a large time mm-hmm I, was, I remarked to Eric after the show too that um, I was just really enjoying the uh, what? Nothing. <laughs> He's right over there. It's Eric. Eric <laughs> Hughes. Um, We're doing the thing that we do when other people talk. We wink gestures at mm -hmm. each other. Yeah, and you flirt with each other. <clears throat> <laughs> well, it, whatever makes you happy, Chad. Go on. Yeah. <laughs> um, you remarked to Eric. Anyway, the men were talking last <laughs> yeah. night. Yeah, after the show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I noticed I, when we first started playing with you early this year, there was, you know, we were starting to develop, you know, a language as not just as a band, but, you know, talking as a rhythm section and I'm trying to, mm. you know, figure out what your, what your, you know, what your pro proclivities are. <laughs> so I could kind of, me too, kind of, yeah, you know, to try to kind of predict subconsciously, you know, what's going on, you know, the, the, the language that we have. Right. And, and didn't really occur to me until last night. I was like, damn it, we, we that just totally got stopped midstream, you know, halfway through that, well, not even halfway in March. And I was just really enjoying, like, particularly in songs like, uh, um, like Spansel, where there's a little bit more uh, sort of, sort of uh, improv improvisation going on. Yeah. Like, you, you'd like from one measure to the next, you might, the kicks might land in different places and stuff like that. So, you know, I, I really have to listen to that to make sure I'm not, overriding <laughs> or, oh, or doing no, anything I, that, that, you I, know I, what think, I mean i think if anything especially a song like that where there's so much space i don't you know i try to keep it sort of the same every time but 
you know, adding a little note here and there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, I'm not talking about major differences. Yeah. But you know, you might throw in a boom, 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 you know, sort of sort of a little accent yeah, one, towards the two. You know, mm, mm. Right. Dun, 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 whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Just kind of plus plus two with a song is that for sometimes for me when a song is that slow and that much space, you want to try to keep that forward momentum happening so it doesn't sound like it's a slow song. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like like the idea of like adding a little bit of extra stuff just kind of propels that song on, on the, on, you know, leaning forward instead mm -hmm. of, you know, laying back like it could, cause it is such a slow song. Yeah. 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 I really enjoyed uh Liverpool too. That was a, a much slower tempo than we've normally played it. And in, in the past that would, that would have freaked me. It really, it seemed fast to me last night, but maybe. Really? No, know, it was definitely know. slower. Okay. But it was, I was like, you know, in the past I might go, Hey, Speed it up, you know, whoever it was drumming, whether it was Mike or somebody before him or somebody was sitting in. Sure. I never really liked that song when it was too slow, but last night I was like, I'm just going to let this ride. <laughs> and it really, really, it was worked. I mean, I, it worked yeah, well. I, th I think we talked about that song too when we first started playing together was like, you know, the way, the way you know, the way Patrick starts it, you know, it kind of has that kind of like, I want to say Cajun-y vibe, but it's kind of that kind of swing. Mm -hmm. I think it has more of a, I mean, obviously you guys were playing it, for a while, like a like a disco song for a, yeah. a long time, mm -hmm. and now it's more like a Cajun kind of swingy thing, and it, it that that really lends itself to, you know, sitting in a, in a good space but still having a nice vibe to it. Right. Yeah. It's fun. Yeah. Well, I purposely I, I purposely started slower on that because we had we had done we had played Gallagher beforehand, very very similar beats, very similar feel, but I wanted to just again. Try to put two songs that, you know, are, are, are kind of similar, but make them different. Yeah. So when you're, when you're, when you're working in a set list, we've talked about this before. When you're talking, when you're, when you're working with songs, what, what we like to do is we like to keep the key of the song uh, diff different. We don't like to do a bunch of songs in the key of G or in the key of A back to back to back because it just, it, it's, it's um, for, for lack of a better term, there's, it's a, it's a different color having uh, a, a new key follow, you know, so, so with, that was a, uh, that was a different key from the, but the songs being so similar, we want to have a different, you want to have a different, uh, you know, meter time, mm -hmm. you know, so tried to slow that one down, but that was, yeah, I, I definitely want to, of course my gear is messing up in it too. I remember the, the button. Yeah. That the I just gear. Replaced. I'm yeah. Like, yes. yeah. The gear. So, um, uh, <laughs> It was good. It was good though. It's, it's a, a, a really very, very little to complain about, which is annoying. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it was just, it, I was, I, I was good. I mean, yeah. And playing, playing a relatively full length show too, for the first time in a while. And then we got to, we got to play a lot of songs that we haven't touched in months. I totally fucked up Galway girl on the intro. I apologize. <laughs> I Anyone? thought that was good. I thought it was cool. I was just going. Yeah, 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 yeah. Patrick looking at his watch. Like, is this song ever going to stop? <laughs> well, it was different too. At the beginning, I think you had been doing something different on the drums before. Yeah, well, we're I, sort of been playing I, together. At yeah, this I beginning. thought that was better yeah. though. When you were just you were just on the hi hat, you know, at first. Well, the the thing was it threw Jeff off because the well, plus the, he, yeah. the, the fiddle has to come in at that different uh, part. So the it can't just be one, two, da, 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 you know, it has to be off off the. Off the one, I guess, or before the one, the fiddle comes in. Mm. Yeah, well, well, whatever it was. Me, it was me, and a different, me and another fiddle player had long discussions about that, and I was just like, "You're working, you're making this harder, way harder than it needs to yeah. be." Just, and then we worked it out, and then I was just like, uh, "Last night, I just kind of forgot. Oh yeah, I'm supposed to come in here, but it's, I kind of like the pause." Yeah. <laughs> what well, course I you do? Love with my Galway girl, yes, I did. Hey, <laughs> go start. <laughs> little, right. we, had time to, we had time to go make a cup of tea, and uh, no, we had so, time to reminisce about that Galway. Uh -huh. hmm. uh -huh. Maybe in the bathroom with some hand lotion, a little Ointment. Nivea Pursuit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what? one little, one little fluffy moment. I, th I like the the groove in that. That was good too. Yeah, that was definitely. That. Yeah, it's and it's it, to me. I think of that same kind of. I keep hating that. That same kind of vibe, that kind of like swingy, you know, kind of chugga, 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 kind of. Mm -hmm. uh, Leslie calls it the sugar, sugar feel. It's like the New Orleans. 
yeah. kind of sw- the swing to it. So okay. Cajun y, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. We're gonna be hearing from Leslie pretty soon. Uh maybe so. Yeah. 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 And, uh, Leslie for all the, the you people that don't know, Leslie is uh she's known as the lovely Leslie, and uh you'll be hearing from her soon. And uh, so yes, yeah, since we've spoken last, we've had a birthday. Mm. Eric had a little birthday. Did. Um fifty one. Really? Fifty one? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I lied to that shopkeeper. Yeah. <laughs> oh, whoops. And, are, you uh, old, are you older than me, Chad? Much. Just by a couple months. By a couple months, that's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But in cat years, he's way older. Cat years, it's way older. Catty. <laughs> and since we've seen you last, too, we had, uh, we had uh, uh, Cindy was on last week. Mm-hmm. That was, uh, that was, uh, that was incredible. We were very tentative when we were talking about Suicide Month and uh having a show on that, but I tell you something, I left there feeling better about that subject, that topic, then then that's not, it's it's not taboo, but it's, it's something that needs to be at the forefront, you know, with the, all the, all the crap that's going on, all the fires, all the bullshit that's going on. It's something to be on the, you know, on the, you know, definitely in front of you, you know, at all times, not just September, but it was uh, that was uh, I was eye opening. I, I learned yeah. a lot, yeah. and uh, Cindy is just such an authority on that uh, figure and uh, suicide talks with a Z on Facebook. Mm-hmm. If you want to go uh, look look at that and uh, just know that there's help seven days. That was great. That was that was fantastic. And then uh, we went to see our, our friend Slade Ham, who was on the week before. We went to see him at the Improv, and uh, he did a tremendous show. We're uh, we were just, uh, he, he was, uh, he, he mentioned throughout the show how uh, he's been off for about the same amount of time as we have. Mm-hmm. I think it was February since the last time he's seen the stage. Um, now he did a show out by Austin a couple of weeks ago, but so he was by, and, and his, his crowd came out. They were, they were very, uh, very ready. For for that, I meant to ask you guys about that. What was the uh, since I didn't go? Uh, you, you, uh, Patrick and Chad went. Um, what was the seating at the venue like? I mean, was it it was, was, it was spaced it was out? Space, spatial? Yeah, they, they had they had they had uh, posters on each on each of the tables that were not to be used, and the, yeah. the staff were very the staff were really well really well. Uh, um, I, I, it looks like they hadn't had any time off at all, just because they were completely at home with the, mm-hmm. with the, the rules and there, you know, and it's so dark in there, which, uh, which I like, but they, they, they seem to run on rails cause they just, you don't see them. Cause when you're, when you're dealing with a, you know, we've talked about this before, when you're dealing with a, a an act like that, a, a, a comedian that night, there were three, actually four, cause the MC was a very good comedian as well. But when you're dealing with that, the last thing you want is to hear bottles clinking and um, we want, what, you know, what do you want? You know, and drink orders. And they, ca- they, they, they work like ninjas. They just, you don't see them. I didn't see them at any other table. Mm-hmm. And yet they were still on. So that's yeah. the, the improv here in Houston. And, um, uh, I, you know, I, I just, we've, we've talked many times on how difficult it is to be a comedian or how, how, what it must be like being a comedian, one microphone, the spotlight's on you and you got to entertain that crap that uh, it just, uh, that blows me away. I, I mm. <sighs> yeah. could not do that. Could not do that. Mm. But uh, Slade brought his, he brought his people out and they, they had a ball. Everybody, everybody in that room had a Yeah. Yeah. It occurred to me when, when I was driving there, because I'd never been to the improv before. I was surprised to see where, yeah, I was surprised to see where it was. It's right in the, in the Edwards, uh, where the Edwards yeah. marquee on I-10 Over is. Yeah. Six on Silver I-10. Road. Yeah. Um, it's right across the, the, you know, the walkway from where, where the theater is. It's like right there. It's been there for years. Oh. I just never saw it. Never, never, never took note of anything else in that shopping center really. And, uh, but, but the other thing too, is I just haven't been to a comedy club. Maybe I could count, you know, on one hand, all the times I've been to a comedy club in my life. I've been to one. I went to the comedy store out in Hollywood when I was out there for the NAMM show a couple of years ago. Okay. I had a day off, went to Who'd Hollywood. Who'd you see? Um, well, I wanted to go see The Big Room, which was um, fucking 
it was, uh, God, it was sold out. So there's a big room and then there's like a yeah. smaller, like kind of upstairs, uh, venue. Um, but the big room was like all the, it was like, I was like, how is this even possible? It was like Joe Rogan and, um, God, who was it? It was like a bunch of big, I mean, I, he was the only one I can remember, Marking but there was names. a bunch of names. I'm just like, oh my God, what a show. And I called to get tickets. Like now nah, we're sold out, but we have tickets in the, mm-hmm. in the back room. And, um, so there was a bunch of comedians that came on and they were all, they were all super funny. They were all great. This one guy, I can't remember what his name was, but he kind of came out and I, as soon as I saw him, I'm like, I'm going to like this guy just by the way he looked kind of had his hair kind of up and his eyes were kind of wide and started talking about, you know, don't put any straws in the, in the ocean and stuff like that. He's grabbing people's drinks. He's like, no more straws kind of a thing. And he went off on this whole tangent about killing fish and stuff like that and eating them. But, but Nikki Glazer came up at the end. She, oh. she was down, she was one of the acts down, that was yeah, downstairs yeah. and she came up, she was like the headliner for the upstairs. So she came up and, and did a thing at the end, and she was super funny too. So, yeah, she is funny. I've only seen her at the on TV, in different roasts and whatever. She seems yeah. to be, yeah, she was pretty good, funny. Uh, but uh, yeah, but the, the the main room was just like, I mean, it was star after star after star after yeah. star, and I can see why it was sold out. Yeah, you know, and this was like on a like a Wednesday or something. Like yeah, that. we used to go. We used to go back in the night. You know, when I first came to town, we used to go to the the last stop. I think it was here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, we we go there. Uh, uh, quite a bit, and there was a, uh, uh, I was, there was an act. I think they were from up north somewhere. Who cares? But uh, uh, <laughs> uh, Malone and Nucci's. They were uh, DC Malone. This uh, I got to know him pretty well through. Uh, we were talking uh, to Cindy about Dennis Lang. Um, used to do the booking around here, but he mm-hmm. he he would take these guys in, and they would like, stay with him and. And it dawned on me when Cindy said she knew Doug Stanhope. I was like, okay, I remember how this goes. Because we would go and we would meet these comics, you know, these road comics and go to, the, so it was a regular, it was a regular thing, you know, on nights off, you'd go to the, to the, to the comedy shop. And then uh, for a while there on TV, they had that, the, which we talked about again, the bands and the comedians would work together. It seemed like the bands would do a song and then they'd bring up the comic and he would do a set and the band would stay and then they'd play him off and bring mm-hmm. the next one. Up. And that seemed like a good, it, it seemed like a good dynamic, except when the comic wasn't any good because the, the, the band was stuck on the, on the stage with him and right. just, you know, so let, let, let's die together. Let's, let's get <laughs> creamed here together. And it was, uh, so it was funny to watch that, uh, how they put that together. I, I couldn't, I couldn't see it happening now, which I wish it would, you know, I, I, I think it'd be great to, to, to get a, a, a really dynamic, uh, authentic, original comic to work with, you know, so especially somebody like us come in there, open the room up and, you know, go up and do a set and, you know, maybe they come back up and do a little, you know, but again, it, it's, it's such a, it's such a fickle, art for you know, or or you know you, you have to you have to get that that comic that fits in that you know what we do because we, we you know we're not we're not your typical rock and roll band we're not mm. a, definitely not a country band definitely not an irish rock band full time you know it's it's yeah. a it's a but you have to have somebody that can come in and and and, and f- f- that humor has to fit that age group because we had we do a very very young and very very old people that like what we do mm-hmm. and uh, one of the one of the shows that was canceled was uh was uh, uh we're gonna hopefully do it next year but it was a 80th birthday party we had a private party that we were gonna do and uh the um the daughter called me and she said yeah you're my mother's favorite band and you know we, we want to have 80 years old we we're gonna do the party and it was just it, it's mind blowing to me, um, but but again, I I promise you this: at eighty years old, I'm still going to be listening to Slayer and Motorhead and Maiden, and yeah. it's it, it's just you know that's what. So you can't you you uh, you can't pin a music genre on an age. That's just not True. gonna. You yeah, know. it's funny you say that. It used to be. I actually thought about, thought about this like in the last twenty four to forty eight hours. Back in New Hampshire, there was this town called Berlin Gorham, and Berlin was the paper mill town so it always smelled beautiful Ah, like savannah potpourri the the aroma 
Um, but, and, and it was kind of like, and the paper mills are closed. So the downtown was at one point kind of thriving. And now it was kind of like, eh, kind of on the downside. But there was a record store there called Hi Ho Records. And uh, when we used to go down there to go shopping or whatever, to, to go to the bigger city or whatever, we'd always go. I said, oh, there's a record store. The first time I went there, I was like, oh, cool, a record store. Let's go check it out. And this is probably in the early, early 80s, early mid 80s or so. And we walked in and it was all metal. All hard rock and all metal record <sighs> store. The owners were in their 60s. I kid you not. This it was, was called Hi Ho. Hi Ho Records, and For, and and on Main like Street in Berlin, New Hampshire. It was a metal store, and I would talk to the owners about music, and they would be like, you know, Rob, Hal you know, Rob Halford's got a great voice, but that Ronnie James Dio, <laughs> he's something special, you know, like shit like that, you know. And they had like wow. all the Slayer stuff. They had all the whatever fringy kind of shit that was out there in, in the eighties, you know, cause everybody started putting out records, you know, and they, you know, the first Megadeth record, all the Metallica stuff, all the black Sabbath, and, you know, Led Zeppelin, Judas Priest, any deep, any, any metal, any different genre, they had it in the store. And I was just like, this is the craziest shit I've ever seen in my That's life. That's cool. These, these old yeah. people are like, yeah, we know. And we, we know to, who these people are. I'm see, just I, I still like to go. Look, cactus is really all we have. We got sound waves, but cactus is the store. And then well, it, I don't know. Six Lagoon, come on. I know it's yeah. claustrophobic, but Six Lagoon. Oh, yeah. When he expanded. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's right. That's right. Way well, more I, room I, in there now. It's ridiculous. It's yeah. Like, I, yes. I, I, and I, I didn't go at that time, too, because I didn't have a turntable. And everything was, he went all LP, it seemed. Yeah. Yeah. But so cactus was always my place because of the CDs and. And LPs and stuff yep. like that, but they, uh, so, uh, um, but basically that's all we have here. Mm -hmm. And back in the day, uh, when we, you would go to get, we, we would just go to get metal records. That's all there was, you know, that's all there was in the world. And, but now when you go in, it, it's, it's crazy to me because you go in a cactus and you, your stakes or whatever, you're just going to go and get these. Uh, these 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 records that that you had listened to as a kid now just stack up on all this stuff and this, the 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 price has just gone just way down on on all these uh, on all these old CDs and stuff like that and mm -hmm. and I, I I can't even remember I I've I've been having to replace all these old records that you know, that they are lost through the years and worn out and whatnot but it's just great Same. to have that yeah. have that collection build back up again to where when, when you were a kid. It just seemed like yeah we didn't have the internet you couldn't just you know call out a name and your computer plays it for you and stuff like that <laughs> you know nothing like that but it just seemed it, it didn't matter that we had to go find that tape rewind it to the song that you wanted for it you know right you know line up that track and then listen to it it didn't it didn't bother you it just didn't it, it wasn't a thing you know that was that was how you listened to music. So well, then and he also had to hear about new releases yeah. somehow through usually through mm -hmm. print media, unless you had MTV, which you know why didn't as a kid? Yeah, we didn't. Uh, you know, they didn't have that on my cable, but you had to like either get the Hip Paraders or the Circus or the Rip or whatever. We didn't have that. We had Kerrang. That oh, was Kerrang. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or or uh, like uh, you know, we used to get when I was in college. This thing called the Boston Phoenix, which is like our. Our uh, what's the free paper we have here? Or the Public News, the, or the Houston Press, Houston, Houston Press, Houston Press, yeah. Yeah. yeah, or like the oh, Chronicle over in, in Austin. And so you'd you'd go and you know, you'd pick up this Boston Phoenix and you looked and I'm wanting to see who was coming to Boston, which was still two hours away from where I was living, but also to see what new records were getting reviewed and stuff like that. Oh, there's so and so is out. Got to go mm -hmm. to the record store to get it. The best moments though that I remember most vividly. Or just walk in. I used to go to record stores all the time. Sure. It was, it was just part of my sometimes sometimes daily routine, <laughs> mm -hmm. depending on what was going on. Yeah, you know, after 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 school, I'd I'd swing by record exchange or or sound warehouse, whatever, just to look around. And sometimes you'd be, get lucky. You'd walk in and there'd be a display of this album that you had no idea was coming out of mm -hmm. a band you love. There it is, right there. Like, oh my god! Oh my god! You know, <laughs> those were the happiest days. You know, you you be running home to listen to this thing. You didn't even know existed until a few minutes before, you know? Um, Can you remember yeah. your biggest disappointment record? Waiting, 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 waiting. Then it came out and you're like, what the fuck are you One you're waiting for? Yeah. Yeah. It was when Peter Gabriel's So came out. 
<laughs> you should have known better. It's Peter Gabriel. Well, no, I mean, up until that point, he had been really weird and, and yeah. experimental. And then it took him forever to put out. So at least it seemed like forever at the time. I think it was only like three years. Yeah, we which, know how that is. Which seemed, like, mm-hmm. which seemed like an eternity at the time, because mm-hmm. back then you're used to artists putting out a record every year. You know, oh, it seemed at like least, yeah. yeah, at least it yeah. really was in the eighties. Yeah. yeah, cut that part out, <laughs> right? And uh, <laughs> he means real artists. We've been yeah. waiting, oh, yeah. waiting, and waiting, and <laughs> finally they put a sing- they, they put Sledgehammer out as a single first. Sledgehammer backed with the B side, uh, "Don't Break This Rhythm." But anyway, so what was, what was the B side? Don't Don't Break This Rhythm. It was just a it was a just a B side. Wasn't on the album. Okay, yeah, it was a much better song than Sledgehammer. I thought fair enough, but. uh We'd heard a friend of ours. We were all into Peter, Peter Gabriel's stuff. Um, my uh, circle of friends I had, and and somebody, one of our friends, had gotten a hold of the single first, and he was like, he was like devastated on the phone. We hadn't heard it yet. He was described <laughs> like he's like, dude, it's bad, it's bad, man. You sold out, and we're like, and we were in denial. It's like it couldn't be that bad. Let, let's put it on. And Peter Gabriel was kind of uh, uh, one of the one of the quirks he had is he play flute. He played flute in Genesis, and occasionally he'd play flute Didn't on the solo that. stuff. Not very often, yeah. So it starts off with flute riff, just just the flute. We're like, oh, this is this is cool. This is promising. And then da 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 da, the horns come in. We're like, <laughs> just What's completely horrified, like because he had never had put down anything that sounded like that before, and it was, and we were, we were it was it was depressing. And then it's funny because the album eventually came out, and I was equally kind of disappointed in that too, but. It, it started to grow on me. I started to appreciate some of the songs later. It took a while. But now it's like, I don't ever go back and listen to that record now. It's like, it sounds to me, people are always talking about what a, what a game changer that record was for the industry and everything. And to me, it sounds like one of the most dated records from that What do period. they mean by that? I don't know. Game changer for the industry. I think if you listen, well, if you listen to a song, and, and this is, to me, a game changer in a bad way. If you listen to a song like <laughs> In Your Eyes, which I know a lot of people love that song, but if you listen to that and you think about a lot of the, the, the syrupy ballad stuff that came in the nineties, um, the, just the production style and also just the overall feel of the song, I think it, that kind of shaped a lot of pro- the production that happened in the nineties, I think that came after it. Huh. So. I've never been longing to, to talk about the Eagles more than I have right now. Well, just, just I'm going to say one more thing, I'm gonna say one more thing about this. The, the saving grace to Sledgehammer is that at the end, it gets louder. Mm-hmm. Like it actually sonically gets louder, which most songs, when you play a song, it sort of stays the same volume through the entire song, mm-hmm. even though more stuff might be happening. But at the end, it actually gets louder which i think is kind of a cool thing it's like it's like they pump up the volume a little bit and then they yeah. bring it back down sure which I, I, which I think is really interesting i'll be honest i mean i don't dislike the song now <laughs> we're just talking about the reaction i had yeah you know and Stuart copeland plays hi-hat on red rain so you can't go wrong with that yes that's true that's, that's the only true. thing he plays on the song is, is hi-hat <laughs> i i can't i just i can't i don't hey, like the album anymore don't give up <laughs> hey i mean i i yeah and pretty much every, I, I listened to some of Peter Gabriel's stuff he did after that, but that was kind of where I, I like, I'm getting off, I'm, I'm out. You know, yeah. I didn't, I didn't well, really. I that, yeah. You know. I can't think of a one that was like, I was looking forward to and I was like, oh man. I, I just, I, I mean, I, I had, I did hear a band live one time and I was like, oh, these guys sound like a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. And I went and bought the record and I was like, oh, this fucking sucks. Yeah. It's terrible. The, oh. the Boo Radleys. Oh yeah, the, remember that? Remember that name? I remember that yeah. name from they, back uh, in the there. cool name. I mean, it's a, it's a character from the, you know the To Kill a Mockingbird, and and it was a cool thing. And I saw them play. They opened up for um, Sugar down in in Boston. Sugar is the Bob Mould from Husker Du, mm-hmm. so his his solo project. And uh, I was like, oh, these guys are kind of fun. And somebody came out and played trumpet, and some, the songs were kind of cool. And I went to uh, the record store the next day and bought that record and I played. I was just like. <laughs> <laughs> What the hell is this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I had uh, ex girlfriend of mine was manager of a shop, and I got this Iron Maiden record that I didn't know was coming out, and it had Blaze Bailey on it. Oh no! And uh, I, I, I just you just lose touch, you know. I don't, don't, I don't watch TV. I don't listen to the, you know, music news or whatnot. But uh, I put this record on, 
I said, "Uh oh, somebody's having a heart attack. <laughs> this guy is not good. And oh, not yeah. good. No, just no personality in his voice." And uh, I, they, they tell me his solos or his his regular stuff was good, but you know, after listening to just being brought up on Paul Diano and Bruce Dickinson singing for yeah. this band, and then having that guy come say, "Uh oh, I think they're recording at the home." Cause this is not, this is not, not rock and roll. It's not. Yeah. And, and, and I saw them play at a toilet up on the North side, Iron Maiden that they, they, uh, they didn't have Adrian Smith or Bruce Dickinson and they, they got the dark ages, huh? the dark day. What year, what years, yeah. what years were that? Uh, was the 90 was mid, mid nineties. And what was Bruce's deal? He just needed a break or. He yeah. He, 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 quit. Career, right? he, he quit. They, they both quit. The history. Uh, Adrian was Adrian was uh, just fed up with the the songs were getting released. They were playing through. I mean, th th think of it. They've sold hundreds of millions of records, and they've they've they, that was a band that would put out a new record every year True. religiously. So they had so many hits, and they had so many so much. Their catalog was massive. So when you get to the the tour, and they've got to knock off songs like. Hallowed be that. I don't know if they knocked that one off, but they had to knock off, you know, War Eagles Dare and all these massive numbers. Take them off because you have to, got to make room. You got to play the new stuff and you got to. Um, so, anyway, Adrian Smith was getting uh, extremely frustrated with the temples because they were racing. And Bruce was, uh, he just had a day, you know, touring 300, you know, 30 days, 340 days out of the year. Right. And these are these are monster shows. These are mostly stadium shows. It just took me all out. So took anyway, out. So, and so so I said, "Oh, I'm going to go and see this band in this nightclub." Essentially, I forget the name of the place. Luckily, luckily for you, <laughs> um, and we went in there. And I remember the first thing I saw. Well, because I went right to the back, and uh, I'm old. I shall be back here. Uh. And um, I went to. Uh, I went to the the back of the room and I saw all these IntelliBeam, which uh, lights these boxes, light boxes, and it looked like they went to guitar. All the guitar centers and bought all their IntelliBeams that the club did mm. before the show. Oh boy! And they were going to bring them back the next day, <laughs> you know. So it uh, it it was uh, it, it it took up more room than the people. You know, than the people in the room, all Crazy. these IntelliBeam boxes. And I was just, the show was horrific in that the band comes out and they're playing and everybody's, oh, and then the singer comes running out, Bla Blaze Belly. This is not who we want to see. And he's, ah, and everybody's looking around him. <laughs> can, can you, <laughs> can you, you know, <laughs> and Nicker McBrain in a, you know, playing drums, you know, on, on a stage that's, uh, on a on a drum riser that's you know eight inches. <sighs> anyway, so that was that was that was a pretty big disappointment. Mm. That's no fun. So yeah, and you know whether 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 he's a good singer or not, it's not that singer. It's not that band that you've you know. So it doesn't matter what they're what they're bringing. You know, and now I will say that anybody anybody after Freddie doesn't get to sing. They, you you just don't just 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 stop. You know, because to, to, to me, that's going to be, that's going to be queen. Ever, ever, mm -hmm. ever, 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 ever. Amen. That's it. No more. Just Freddie. But you, you put in whoever it was, the Highlander, whoever they had singing for, for queen. And it just, uh, the Highlander. I don't care. I don't, <laughs> I don't care what you're, I don't care what you sound like. I don't care what you, no, George Michael. All right. There he is. Uh, he gets to do somebody love. That's, that's no problem. He gets to. Oh Yeah. Yeah, but uh, he, he's gone too, isn't he? All right. Yeah, he. Uh, but the yeah, <sighs> singer like that. That's it. Nobody else. Hmm. Yeah, I can think of more times. I I not sell a new record, but going back to 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 listen to to bands the catalog of a band that I got into was like, wow, these guys are great. And you go back and pick an album that has a song on it you know you like, and the album itself is like really disappointing. I'm thinking of like uh, to speak of the Queen, like a Hot Space, which has yeah. like the one has Under Oof. Pressure on it. That's pretty much. Maybe there's one other good song on there, but it's like, from what I recall, it's been a while since I listened to it. But I remember picking up that cassette years ago and like, 
That's, that's a tough, li- that's <laughs> yeah. a tough listen. It's expecting it to be as brilliant yeah. as Under Pressure, you know, which there's just no way that yeah. it was going to happen, I guess. But Freddie Mercury's solo records were a disappointment too. Uh, you know, unless you're grinding at a club. Where are you grinding now? Uh, if you're, uh, but there was, there was, there was a, uh, Mr. Bad Guy was one of the records that I, I got, and, and I just, uh, there was a lot of, a lot of really difficult stuff to get through. But at the end of the day, if you're a vocal fan, if you're a vocal, you know, I mean, that's, that's, the guy, guy couldn't have, you know, a set of pipes and just mm-hmm. sounded great. And there was, it, it was just, again, too kind of disco-y for, for, for me. But at the same time, there was, there was little, little shots of Queen throughout to keep people mm-hmm. listening to the, to the record. But yeah. that was, uh, that's some tough listens. Yeah. You know. Any of your big, big, big artists like like Sting or these any of these other guys that you've, you, well, you you were talking about that once before. Like there was one album, there's one album. Remember you were talking about one, at least one of his albums that you said was kind of like, eh. I was the Celine. Who was this? Sting. Sting. Yeah. So yeah. So after Soul Cages, I had lost interest completely. And that was ni- early nineties. No, Soul Cages was uh, actually Soul Cages was like ninety one. Ninety one. Yeah. Yeah. Ninety or ninety one. Mm-hmm. And I liked that. I mean, I liked, I'll say, I don't care. I'm a man. I liked those Sting solo records. I mean, I think they were interesting. They were different. They were kind of, they had, he had some really great players on those records. Manu Cachet on drums, Omar Hakim on drums. Come right. on, that's ridiculous. Right. Daryl, Daryl Jones on, on the, on, on the, on the bass and you know, that, that kind of stuff. On, on the trumpet. Yeah. Although, but I did listen to, I think I pulled up, soul cages a while ago and, and like like your peter gabriel it's just the sound of it sounds dated dated yeah yeah. it does sound like there's a couple of songs like oh i, I, I just like this song and i hear it and it's just like this the weird like the way the synthesis the keyboards and synthesizer sound it's like oof, yeah this is not aged well yeah but then then when he came out with that uh if i ever lose my faith in you yeah there was something else, and it whatever rhymes with you i was like yeah this is terrible <laughs> This is terrible writing. I mean, that, and that's the chorus. Yeah. And he's like sitting in a throne with a sword, like swinging at waves. I mean, this is, I'm not going to tell you no, what it sounds like. Because note to self. I'll, I'll you, tell you off camera what it sounds like. It just sounded like shit. Yeah. I mean, it just sounded. You talked about that before. I, I, it's funny. I just, it's funny because I never thought. Like praying. Praying. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm not familiar enough with Sting's catalog to, to know what, what's good or bad. That just struck me as like, oh, that's a catchy tune. You know? And all but, the drummers, uh, all my drummer friends freak out about those later Sting records because Vinny, I think we've talked about this before too. Vinny Caliuta plays mm-hmm. on it. And there's a couple of songs, there's a song in five or a song in seven or whatever. Mm-hmm. And people are like, oh man, this is the coolest shit ever. I'm like, he's just playing quarter notes mm-hmm. that go over the bar line. It's not like he's playing the Zappa shit that he played so well, or he's, he's not playing anything that we can't, that's, that's difficult. Mm-hmm. It's not mind bending. It's not genre altering. It's not anything new. It's just, he's just playing and people freaked out about it. I'm like, this is, we're freaking about the wrong things. <laughs> we're freaking out how terrible this song is. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and we I, talked I, about, I'm sorry. We talked about synchronicity the other day too. Mm-hmm. And that record is, it's a decent Police records, not as good as some of the other stuff, but it also points to the direction. You can tell exactly yeah. what direction Sting was going to go in. Well, for me, it's like within side a month. one. Forget side two. Side one is the only part of that album I like to listen to. Yeah. You know, just anyway. from Synchronicity 1 to Synchronicity 2, that's like, to me, that's the album. Every All the other stuff is just Sting solo stuff that's boring. <laughs> Although I will say, whatever, uh, that, that Atlanta concert that they filmed, you know, the, the, yeah. the, the Synchronicity tour that they filmed that they showed everywhere, the synchronicity, whatever that first one is on that on that on that concert, the, the opening song, yeah, f- fucking killer. And he, yeah, he did it. But the keyboards are going or whatever yeah, in the yeah, background, yeah. and mm-hmm. Sting goes one, two, and Stewart comes in, just fucking ripping. That's, oh my god, it's so good. That's got to be one of the best beginnings to any song, synchronicity one, because it's. Like a lot of police songs, like the beat doesn't come in where you think it's right, going to come. Exactly. So it's yeah. kind of surprising. Every time I listen to it, listen to it, it's like this exhilarating. Oh yes, that's yeah. where it starts. And then watching, yeah, Stewart back yeah. there. Just, well, yeah. I, I, I have to retract some because I, I, I hate Sting only because I love the police so much, and I, I don't, you know, I didn't want that band to end. Mm-hmm. And then they came back and they did it again, and you see why yeah. they're so great. 
So that's why I hated Sting. Now I have to say that I don't like that song you were talking about. Whatever the one was. Ever lose my faith in yeah. you? Yeah. Well, I, I, why would you like that song? Of course I would. You know, because I have. Why well, does anyone like I have that song? Genitalia. I mean, it's, you know exactly. But um, male genitalia. That's what. That's 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 the that's the. Well, that's the we're ticket. Gonna, we're going to we cut that part out again. <laughs> Second time surgery. So, um, but I do appreciate his songwriting and especially you know when 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 you listen to Stuart Copeland talk and he's like you know they're all writing songs and then Sting would bring his songs and they go oh we want to play that one you know <laughs> you know that's the that's the time that you go okay well he had something but uh, as as a as a three piece playing that playing that way and having that so Eric was talking earlier about uh we were talking about Spansel Hill Synchronicity, Spansel Hill. Um, when and he's talking about space in a song. When you listen to a band as good as ZZ Top or The Police, this is a three-piece band, and they're able to leave space when needed, and then place play together and fill those songs. There is nothing better. Mm -hmm. There's just nothing better on this earth than hearing that three piece orchestra, you know, that just that could, because not that anybody's overplaying Stuart, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> nobody's overplaying, nobody is underplaying and everybody's carrying the same weight. And that song that, that those songs that they're putting are, are just it, the hair on the back of your neck will stand up. You'll cry. You will. I have, I, and I watched the later shows, you know, when they, when they did the reunion, I watched some of the, some of the YouTube stuff and they would, they would just play these songs. And I just, I, you know, a lot of nostalgia for sure. just the ability to, to get that sound and to, to, to put, create that energy and the melodies and the beat and just, it's, it's something to behold. It, yeah. There's nothing, yeah, I, I don't think there's anything better on the planet than that. Yeah. I'm not talking about that band, just that, 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 you know, like ZZ Top do it as well. They do it with no, they don't break a sweat. You put them out in LaGrange, you know, 115 degrees at direct sunlight, and those guys will not break a sweat, and they'll just mow it, or just, just mow you down. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, the, the, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, I think I need a tranquilizer. Okay, I need a I'm tissue. excited now. A tissue? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was. We, we think we talked about this already too with that documentary that came out a few years ago that was a about their their reunion tour. Yeah, and yeah, I I never really understood until I watched that just how dysfunctional they were as a band. It's like, oh, that's why they broke up so early, <laughs> you know. And it's it's almost a perfect timing too. I mean, it's like they they synchronous. I mean, like I say, I only like half the album. It's not a bad album. But I mean, they, they didn't really take things, you know, a lot of bands kind of limp along like that. The really successful bands where they, it just it starts to deteriorate and it becomes embarrassing, more and more embarrassing over time. <laughs> but they never had to go through that, thankfully. No, I mean, I mean, that record Stop was huge. Off. I mean, yeah. and, and what a way to end on a high note, you know, for yeah. them. I yeah. mean, I mean, if they, if they, if they made a, would have made a record after that, would it have been as good or as popular i mean mm -hmm. that was the record that brought them to the mainstream because yeah. i think before people kind of knew who they were you know the really hardcore fans obviously knew who they were but the mainstream public i mean every breath you take i mean everybody knew that song mm -hmm. doesn't matter where you came from everybody knew knew it you know had heard that song and knew that song yeah and probably liked that song but Not i think a great one but you know. it's it's clear though they had had they stayed together i mean they, they probably would have injured each other <laughs> if they hadn't already <laughs> because sting and sting and, and Stewart and yeah they just, are just yeah, at each other's very strong the personalities yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah obviously yeah it was just very entertaining watching that which i know the stuff that even the stuff that was on camera i'm sure was probably even you know more toned down than probably what would happen actually happen when well, the cameras I mean, weren't imagine, trained you know, on them imagine being sting and walking up and looking at Stewart's drums and seeing on ta tape fuck off you cunt i mean he's yeah. basically t that's his message to yeah sting yeah it's written on his drums right and he hits those drums every single night while he's playing behind sting i mean just like that amount of animosity is is uh 
challenging for anybody. Yeah. And let, let alone being in a band where you're on the road with each other for how many nights a year and you're in the studio and you're still trying to work together, you know, they call it a toxic workplace, I believe in the, uh, in the regular world. One of my favorite things from that, that documentary is they, there's one point where they're, they've gotten over the shouting part and they're, they're like being really trying to be really cordial and they're like negotiating over different song parts. Like there's some, there's some bit, some flam. <laughs> I can't remember what song it is. Some flam that Stuart was doing that, that Sting didn't like. And he, and he goes, they, they're running through it and Sting stops. It. That's it. Oh, that's it. Oh, interesting. I'll tell you what, I'll give you that. If you don't do this one other part, some, some bass light or something you're like, okay, all right, fine. You know, <laughs> They have to, there has to be uh, some kind of give and take this is, in this order is, to get the arrangement. This is the new documentary? Yeah. I haven't seen it. I got to watch this now. Yeah. Yeah. I got to see It's it. where the, the rehearsal clips are in black and white. That's how you know you're watching. I can't remember what it's called. That's not that video that you sent me about that drum fill that's going to be on everything. It's from that same documentary. Okay. Yeah. That's so ridiculous. Yeah. Where he's, where he's talking about. Yeah. Stuart overstepped his bounds on that one. Yeah. <laughs> that fill did not work. No. I don't know what he was doing. I get it. I mean, I like what you're going for. <laughs> the best part of that is Sting's reaction to it, where he just stops playing. He just starts like, laughing. He's just like, <laughs> what was that? What was that? That was funny. And, and Andy, too, is quiet the whole time, and he just mutters, like, eh, thanks for going He's... so well. <laughs> <laughs> but And, and, anyway. and then, and, and which I, I, I don't like to take Sting's side, ever, but when you, mm. when you, when you play, when, when the drums play over a vocal line, and you're trying to get the message across in that moment, and there's a drum fill there, and 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 Stewart doesn't do mediocre or poor drum fills. He does great drum fills. Very acrobatic. But when you put it there, he wants that space for the message, maybe in a bottle, maybe in you know. But he is th that 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 song is written for you know for that for that space the the words go in that spot and you put this fill and it's and it's just I, I know many times now that we're we, we have the in ears I pointed to my ears in case you were, you were thinking that we they go up here not they go in here but the 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 in ears really open everything up to where you're able to see feel hear these songs and how they go but when before that when we didn't have the in ears and you're playing through monitors and the drummer plays over your spot where you're, you know, you, you maybe want to use some dynamic or a different inflection or a new, you, you just physically can't do it. You can't shout over that. And it's, so I understand that, you know, oh, yeah. and that everybody has their, 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 you know, their idea how the song's going to go. And that's the beauty of a, that, a three piece like that. Mm -hmm. They know where the spots are, you know, eventually. Time will show them exactly where all the spots go and where, where things, but. And I, I can kind of see from watching those two guys, I can kind of understand both of their points of view because Stuart is like a painter. You know, he kind of wants to do what he wants to do in the moment. And that's, I totally understand that, especially from a drummer's perspective. Um, not that I'm a drummer, but I've worked with a lot of drummers. Hmm. And then, then you have, then you have Sting, who's who, who's who is a composer, and he he doesn't just write the songs and the melody. He in his head, he's got you know he's like Brian Wilson. He hears everything in a song, as he describes in that documentary. He's used as a solo artist. He's used to being able to conduct everything. Right. And Stewart doesn't like being conducted. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> and there, that's basically that in a nutshell. Which is odd because Stewart's a composer too. Yeah. And yeah. he has yeah. and he has actually conducted. Yeah, before yeah. actually yeah. physically yeah. conducted orchestra and stuff like that. Yeah. So, it, but, it, but yeah, I, I like operas. Yeah, I like that analogy that he's like a painter and he's kind of because he's yeah, and I I think he's definitely more in the moment. He's definitely a more in the moment right. player, big um, time. Obviously, yeah. He, like I mean, he's like he's like you in, in the sense that he doesn't he, he doesn't doesn't have your temper. I mean, sorry, he you don't have his temper. I should say <laughs> at least at least not outwardly. We don't know that. <laughs> But I mean, you know, you, you don't like being, as you've just, you've said many times on the show, you're, you're not fond of being just playing drums in a sense where you press play and then you just play the same thing every, every single night. Yeah. You know, I think that's what Sting really wants from his band within, yeah. it's within a certain right. parameter, right? Stuart really seems to, to require more, more freedom than, than Sting is comfortable with. I think so. So 
So who would you guess right now is, uh, just from the catalog that's stuck in your head, who would you think is the worst person to work for of all the bands you listen to? Who would be the worst? I thought you were going to say of all the bands you played in. Huh? No, I, guess, <laughs> I, 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 I know. Yeah, yeah. I, know. <laughs> I think we've heard that story already. Um, God, that's a good question. Who would be challenging to work for? Yes. Uh, but as much as you I love know. them, you wouldn't want to work with yeah. them. Yeah. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm. Because, you know, you've heard the stories of, you've, you know, your buddy Rich and, uh, oh, God. you know, you've heard these stories of these, uh, not even prima donnas. These are, these are essentially dictators with. Well, the first person that comes to mind, just because you can see it, the documentary's old documentary about it, Chuck Berry. Yeah. What, 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 what Keith Richards went through to try to rein him in to get a good show out of him. Um, yeah, I wouldn't want to go through that. <laughs> well, I think, I think that's different than actually playing with Chuck Berry mm-hmm. with, with, the, with the sense that because like, you know, Alan and David and, and, and those guys have played with Chuck Berry. Yeah. And it was basically like, hey, here's the show. Boom. That's it. Right. Like, that's easy. Right. But the idea of rehearsing with him. Right. Like that's said, the thing. Keith, Keith was like challenged. And I totally, what Keith was trying to do and, and he accomplished amazingly for that. And that sh- they used to watch that, right? Oh yeah. Right? Hell, hell rock and roll. Yeah. Yeah. He, he pulled off the impossible. Of course he was only able to do it once. However, I'm assuming it was that one show that was in the film. Yeah. I think, I think it was. But he went time. through hell. Yeah, oh yeah. No, to, get, was... to get that show out of him. Yeah. And yeah. And, and I wouldn't, want to do yeah. <laughs> i really admire him for doing that somebody had to do it i guess yeah but that, this yeah. is after he'd been punched in the face by him <laughs> yeah for a completely unrelated reason ridiculous yeah there's so many you I know think. you hear the stories of of you know these tempers and these you know the the, yeah. the chuck berry thing of the, the changing key on the that's the best you know, on, on the fly with with you know it, that's that's okay if you're just doing you know if the three chord Diddy, you know, but if you're playing, uh, you know, a Chuck Berry song is going to be, you know, going to be, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of stuff to it. Mm-hmm. Um, that that's the beauty. Again, that's the beauty of Chuck Berry is it sounds so simple, but you know, the, the end of the day, it's a, yeah, no, it's yeah, it's deceptively hard. Yes, for a lot of and, reasons. And that's that's a performer. What a, what a great performer. Anyway, yeah. but uh, but you know, so I, my, you know, I I I just I I couldn't imagine. I couldn't imagine going in and doing like a Cirque du Soleil uh, show, oh, you know, right. where they learn all these crazy pieces and there's just, just, you know, uh, but again, like having that one person, like the, the Buddy Rich always comes to mind just with the, with the, just this shit that yeah, I heard. he was a fucking asshole. Yeah. Um, and, and, and of course, you know, yo, I always think of, cause you've seen so many documentaries on, on Iron Maiden, I think I've watched everything on Iron Maiden. I think I've read everything, but those guys work so well together because everything just runs through Steve. Mm-hmm. You know, at the end of the day, it's if you bring in a, a you know, a, it, it doesn't matter what you bring in. If he likes it, it's just going to go through him. And it's going to get made nice through Steve. So he's the made nice. Yeah, he's gonna he's gonna be the. So, but again, and he's so laid back, and he's such a. Easy. So you're saying he'd be hard easy. to work with? Oh, easy to work with. You said hard to work with. You know, I, I, I know I'm saying. I'm the, <laughs> the question yes, was, can, the question can you read was, it back, please? <laughs> yes. Senator. So, so if you're, <laughs> if you're, if you're trying to, to, cause none of us want to, I, I mean, I, I'll say this, Chad's the easiest going of us when it comes to getting a song for anything. Him. Everything. Yeah, no, he seems no, no. seems very easy going. No, if you talk to the if you took the survey on the women leaving his place and yeah, the well, thing, it's yeah. not, it's not, yeah. a, it's a. Anyway, so uh, are you talking about establishing an arrangement? And I said scrambled eggs. Just, 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 just working mm-hmm. with. Mm-hmm. You're eager and into it, and you know, and and even if you've heard it for the first time, you'll. I think early on, with w- w- one of the big things that you would do is you you would try to rearrange it as it happened. I go. Wait, yeah, but yeah. now it's let's play it. Let's mm-hmm. get let's give it a shot. Mm-hmm. So we're lucky in that regard. But then the three of us are, are are not easy in. So 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 I I bring I bring, you know, Mary had a little lamb. You know, Steve Ray Vaughan. Or we bring something that none of us like. Hey, let's do Hotel California. There'll be three people saying no, right off the bat. Mm. 
so, 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 so there's nothing easy about just, you know, do, doing something f- for the reason, for the sake of doing it. So, but so let's say now you've got this great idea and you've got this riff and you've got this song and you want to, pre- you know, and, and then you bring it to this band and, and, and you have to fight through, you know, cause I, I, I you know, I know Queen would, would fight. Uh, you know, to, to get their song on the record, right? To to, to get the single, they would, mm-hmm. con- you know, and that made for a bit. But again, they, they looked like they worked okay together. Yeah. So, so I'm thinking, and I, I I know we've worked with people that we would absolutely choke to death before we'd do it again. You know, we learned that lesson. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, who is that? Who is that person that that you're? Uh, who you're? Just really kind of, yeah. I, I think I would have a hard time with anybody that wouldn't allow not free reign, but the, uh, the ability to be creative input instead yeah. of playing the same thing every single night, the same drum fill, the same play it like the record kind of thing. You know, yeah. I know James Brown was kind of that way. I know he was really hard oh, on yeah. his guys and yeah. didn't pay them well and yeah. would find them if they fucked up or didn't wear the right. Yeah. Whatever. You know, so that kind of that kind of environment can be really challenging to a player. Mm-hmm. Especially since, you know, he had so many great players in his in his roster over the years and not allowing them to kind of stretch out. So I know that can be challenging, you know, but working for someone like Buddy Rich who would berate you, you know, um after the gig and 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 you know, just just tear you a new one, you know. Um I don't know. I can't think of anybody specific that that, that I that I like, that I would be like, oh my yeah. god, I wouldn't want, I wouldn't want to. Yeah, I would. I mean, I would love to play with all all the people that I like, you know. At, uh, um, but I don't know. It's a it's a hard one. Yes, I'm thinking of all, all my biggest heroes, and they're all pretty, pretty good collaborators. I'm thinking of like you know, like to think so. Well, David Bowie's worked with a lot of people. David Burns worked with a lot of people. Peter Gabriel. Peter Gabriel's actually hasn't. Well, he has collaborated, but he he's one of those guys who has to have full control over stuff i think but um maybe him. but he tends to work with the same people from year to year you know for the most part so it couldn't be that hard to work with well, I, I heard I heard, I heard i rumor sure but maybe tom Araya. i don't know he seems like it might be a challenge who? Oh, I, I don't think so from slayer yeah oh Kerry king though yes that well, guy's a fuck that guy piece of shit <laughs> <laughs> i mean you're gonna get the same song every time so yeah you, i don't know um, yeah. but bowie i heard I think it was uh, Dave Grohl or somebody. He was like, no, I don't want to. Really? Yeah. I, that's what I heard. And I was tip of the hat. I think, yeah, there was definitely some people. Well, he, he didn't work well with he and, he and Freddie. I mean, getting, getting under pressure done yeah. was a pain was a pain in the ass. For, for, I think it was more stressful. It sounds like it was more stressful for Freddie than it was for anybody else. But, but as, as the story, as, as Brian May and Roger Taylor tell it, is that, they, that Freddie basically let they kind of all backed off to let to kind of let uh bowie finish off the song since he had such a sol- solid idea of where it was going but freddie was not happy with it you know yeah they were arguing with each other over during the process but uh most of the people i know who've worked with bowie they they all just love him to death yeah you know yeah ricky gervais was the last person that, that i heard talk mm-hmm. about bowie in such a such a honest real just in the moment. And it was just beautiful. Be- every story he told about his, cause he was such a huge Bowie fan. Yeah. But he was, uh, he, he, he really got to know him and, and, and he's such a great storyteller anyway. Yeah. It's a, it's, it's well worth listening to. I, I think probably the only guys who would have a, a bone to pick would be the guys who got, you know, when he, when he broke up the spiders from Mars. Yeah. You know, and just did. I was talking to Hunt sales about, Bowie. Yeah, well, Hunt, yeah. Hunt wasn't. He's. I don't. Think I know that they. I know. I don't think Hunt is still happy about that. Yeah, yeah. When I talked to Hunt back in two thousand and two or three or whatever, he was, and David came. David was coming to town, and I just casually said, "You're gonna go." No, fuck that. He's like. He yeah. said. I think. He, I think he was. I think he was married at the time. And he had a couple of kids. Hunt said he, he he got tickets for the for the for the girls to go. Yeah, and they went to go see the show. Yeah, yeah. Or whatever. That's but he shame. was like, no. Yeah, that breaks my heart to hear that. I was really looking forward to, you know, another album from them, but, you know. Oh, well. Bowie had other things he wanted to do. 
Yeah, you know. Charlie Watts actually spoke kind of irreverently about David Bowie. He's like, really? yeah, he, Charlie, Charlie Watts. Yeah. He's like, yeah, he's not really quite the guy you think he was, but that's really? Charlie too. So <laughs> who knows what's up that guy. Yeah. I, I, I'd, say, I'd, say, you know, I'd say Mick Jagger would be hard to, I, I wouldn't want to play for him because you have to play Rolling Stone songs. And who wants to do that? <laughs> Nobody wants no to do one. that. <laughs> Nobody wants to say, fuck Charlie Watts too. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. He well dressed. I like the way he dresses. He collects pocket watches. That's yeah. his big thing. He likes to go on when when he would go on tour. He would he would uh, he's like, what do you like to do when you're on the road? He's like, I like to go to antique stores and look for old pocket watches and buy them. That sounds exactly like you know. That's but well, maybe he just wants to be a timekeeper. Hey, hey. a timepiece. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I'm just pissed off. We just talked about the Stones. That's okay. <laughs> we talked about them in a bad in bad light though. That's 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 fair. That's something. That's something. Yeah. Something. Anything. Yeah. I'll give you a little satisfaction. Yeah. On the top. top. Yeah. I guess I I, I can see it definitely from Hunt's perspective too, that because Bowie did continue to work with Reeves (laughs) for the rest of that decade, you know, so that probably stung. I I can see how that probably stung. Yeah. I mean, I I don't, we know, I don't know what the, besides wanting to do something else. I don't know. Maybe we need to get Hunt on the show. Yeah. Let's do it. Ask him. Just flat out. Hunt, what the fuck's up with David Bowie? Yeah. Well, let me tell you something about that guy. <laughs> Maybe we don't need him. Maybe we're just going to get it right yeah. now. Let's imitate him. Yeah. And Tim- Cybercast, 85, 89. <laughs> and Tim Machine wasn't the only thing that Bowie, because Bowie, I mean, about, every time you hear or read interviews about, uh, with him about Tim Machine, he loved that band. He really loved the band. At least that's mm. what he says. I don't know what happened. But that's, he wanted to keep continue working with him. But there was also another thing he did in the 90s that he didn't finish. He was supposed to do a whole new trilogy with Brian Eno. That started with Outside. There were supposed to be two more albums. That never happened. Those that albums never record materialized. Outside is fucking rough, dude. I love that record. Really? Man. Yeah. I you, bought it just on principle and I gave it away. Now I don't have it anymore. It's a hard <laughs> sell. It's a hard sell. That's the thing about Bowie. It's like people love him for different reasons and different songs. You know? Well, I mean, I think a lot of great artists are, are, are that way. Yeah. I mean, you'll, you'll, you'll like the Bowies and the, and the Todd Rundgrens and, and, and yeah. the so-and-so. You know, you'll... you'll uh, the Iron Maidens too. I mean, and then Black Sabbath and all the all these bands. You're like, I really like this stuff, but this stuff, I'm I'm gonna hang on because I know something new is coming out. Mm-hmm. It might be better, and usually they come around and and, yeah. and something. Well, at least that you know you might enjoy. Other people, like you said, mm-hmm. there's a fringe group of people that really are gonna buy and enjoy no matter what. Uh, whatever so and so artist right. puts out. Yeah. And others are like, oh man, I bought this record. Like I bought a couple of Todd records. I was like. Mm. Fuck that! <laughs> I don't want to hear that again. You know. Yeah. No, Bowie's the same. Right, right, right before outside, he put out. Ten, uh, what was it? No, what was it called? Not Tim Um Black tie, white noise. Um, which you never really hear about that record anymore because it really didn't make much of a splash. And but it was funny because it was more commercial sounding. You know, mm. It was a little bit more, less you know, less adventurous, less uh, less uh, risky, mm. and uh, kind of boring. <laughs> you have that. Keep, dark, you have that Dark Star record. Black Star. Black Star. Yeah. Black Star to me sounds, it's like a little bit, some of the weirder stuff on that reminds me of Outside a little bit. Mm. Um, like the title track off of there. And uh, I like Lazarus. That t- I like that first track. I can't, I, I've only heard it a couple of times, but like when it, when it goes from being the New York choppy thing to like the more like song. Mm-hmm. I like that part of the song, but I get what he was going for, but Not, look what happened. It fucking killed him. <laughs> What what if if you were to choose a Bowie record, what would you listen to? What's your I don't really know him that well. I'd probably probably well, say a, a Ten Machine thing. Yeah, yeah, probably probably Ten Machine one, the first one. Okay. Yeah. So you would probably if you, I would I would recommend if you haven't listened to it, uh, listen to a record, the Scary Monsters, his solo record from nineteen eighty, and Lodger. Uh, those are the two that sound the most like Ten Machine to me. Mm. I think. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Anyway. Anyway, enough about Bowie. That was yeah. a lot of Bowie. Yeah. Bowage. So did we, did we touch, did everybody give an answer to that question? I guess we have. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah, I said James Brown. Yeah. Or the Rolling Ish. Stones. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, there was a cool story about where uh, Bootsy, uh, with his, his, the time he spent working with James Brown, that is, you know, I'm sure he- He was he, like the second, the second- uh, Second bass player? S- no, well, no, no. Well, no. You should say second baseman. Ba- ba- base <laughs> nice. <laughs> now starting second base. Bootsy, Ootsy, Bootsy, Bootsy, Collins, Allens, Allens. Hey, hey, hey. Um, I think he he was like, he was like that second generation. Yeah, 
And when the set in the like early 70s, right? I yeah, I think yeah. so. Yeah. He was just a kid. He was like 18. Oh, he's fucking just, yeah. But like, he what a this, monster player. It was an important, obviously, obviously he didn't stay with him probably for the reason you said he was hard to work with. Him. Or maybe he got other offers too. I don't know if he went straight to Parliament after that or, or what. I think he was too big of a star for James. Yeah. yeah. He was becoming too big of but, a star. Right, right. But he, there's some great footage of him early on, you know, of him playing with with uh, with James, and he's so un- it, it's not the flashy Bootsy that we know now. It's like you barely recognize him because mm-hmm. he just looks like a normal guy. Yeah. But he's uh, he tells a great story about how James taught him how to play how to play on the one because he, he was a, he was a great player. He he learned, but he as he as he told it, he learned to be really he would, he would noodle around a lot and and uh, thought he really had it down, but. And when James came up to him after, I guess, I don't know, when it was the first rehearsal or said, man, where's the one? I can't hear the one. Mm-hmm. And that totally. That was a great changed. impersonation. <laughs> <laughs> that totally <laughs> opened up, you know, Bootsy didn't really become Bootsy, I think, until he, he learned how to play with James. Well, yeah. I mean, it's like James is, how long can you play the E9 chord? <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, there you go. So, uh, so by the time you hear this, uh, we're going to the three of us. One, me, two, him, three, you, yeah. We're gonna go up to uh, a place called Bryan, Texas. It's just outside of College Station, which you've heard us mention before. And we're gonna go to Blackwater Draw Brewing Company. Mm-hmm. Water Brewing Company. And we're gonna go see our friend, uh, our friends, Chris and Stephanie Steele. And we're going to uh, we're gonna play for them next Friday. We're gonna live stream. Yes. Yep. So we're going to play a couple of songs you might not have heard before. Mm. We're going to rock medium to hard. And we're going to, uh, we're going to have a really good time. We're going to, I don't know how we're going to do this, but, but, but uh, we should have thought about this before, but we're going to try to, uh, we're going to try to give away some beer. Oh yeah. Um, and we can't, mail it so we're probably only gonna have to give it to some to a winner in houston but we're gonna figure something out because uh blackwater is just getting back on their feet and o'bannon's hopefully will be soon afterwards yeah and these are uh we've mentioned it so many times i feel silly saying it but i'm used to being silly so uh chris Steele has been chris and stephanie from o'bannon's blackwater they have been more than exceptional and more than generous and more than wonderful to us throughout our whole 16 years mm-hmm. as blackguards. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, we're going to go up there. We're going to try to, we're going to try to bring a lot of people and uh, re- responsibly, and we're going to, we're going to have a good time. We're going to, going to throw down. And so a f- few surprises for you. And we're, we're going to give away some beer there. And we're going to hopefully bring some back to Houston and give it away. We'll just figure out some competition. Some we're going to figure out for the next yeah. episode. Yeah. Beer won't go bad. No. Unless me and Chad drink it all. That, uh, that would be better beer. Unless Chad drinks it all. Hmm. Anyway. I'm good for like it one. It could happen. I'm yeah. good for like one. That's going to be cold as shit too. So. Oh. Cold, yeah. cold as shit. Cold as shit. Yeah. I think I know her. It's an, it's an example. It's, 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 it's a phrase. Okay. Anyway. Okay. I digress. So. <laughs> so, yeah. So a lot to, uh, and, and also we're talking to um, my, uh, our good friend, June Nanana. Uh, we're do, working do, with do, them do, do. in, in, uh, uh, by doing a Midwest tour. And uh, now in this climate, yeah, fucking right. We're going to go out, we're going to get in the van, we're going to go. So we're talking to some places up there. So if you're listening up in the, uh, I don't know, Kansas, Iowa, Nebraska area, we'll, we might come see you. And it might be as soon as next month. We're working on it right now. So. Come real quick. Yeah. And I say we're going to do it responsibly. That means we're going to put uh, a helmet on the drummer. Mm-hmm. So. Right? Yeah. Okay. When I ride in the van, I got to wear my helmet. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Special helmet. So. CCM. And also we're, uh, Lori, uh, we all know Merch Maiden, mm-hmm. Lori, uh, of, of, of our mask fame. And uh, she's, she's unloaded all our gear for us. 
physically, you know, mm-hmm. the, the PA and the merchandise. So uh, uh, Lori uh, and I are working on a, a show down in the Richmond Rosenberg area. So we, we're, we're going to hopefully have some, inf- we, not hopefully, we will have some information on that by the, by the, by the time this comes out. So check our website. Uh, we, we do have masks. We do have some t-shirts. Our, our store is open and our, mm-hmm. our, uh, our, our, we're, we're really excited because now we're in the mixing process of by the time you hear this today is what Monday or Tuesday, by the time you hear this, we'll have already started the mixing process. So we're, of we're what? mixing what? Our new record. Cake? New record. Oh, the record. The new record. Yeah. Okay, Which cool. is yet to be titled. Yeah. yeah. It's yet to be titled new record from Blaggards yes. coming out this fall. Yes. Be dialing people. Be yeah. pledging your money. Be, wait, this is not the, te- the telethon. What am I talking oh, about? Yeah. yeah, we will. Uh, not sure when this is going to happen. We can, probably wouldn't help if we had the title of the album for first. But we we're going to have pre-orders for the record. Uh, and there will be an LP version of this. Ooh. Vinyl. Real Blaggards on vinyl for the first time. Um, so you, you'll be able to buy pre-order digital, pre-order CD, pre-order LP, or all three of them if you want. So we'll we'll have those details sometime in the next few weeks. Not sure exactly when we're going to do that, but it will be happening. I think we're just going to call it New Record. New Record. <laughs> nice. Yes. Okay. Cool. All yeah, right. thanks for listening. Thanks, thanks for Thanks for telling your friends. Thanks for being nice to each other. Thanks for being safe. And... Well, uh, hopefully, thanks for coming out to see us. Yeah, yeah. Again, this Friday, September 25th, 7 p.m. Central on Facebook. Link yeah. in the description. Right. Yeah, and, a, and, if, and you're, if you're in if the you're, area. If you're, if you're, yeah, if you're within 800, 900, 2,000 miles, <laughs> come on to Come that. on down and buy come some beer. Down. Buy some yeah. beer. Yeah. They got new shirts, too. Blackwater Drive. They new Good. shirt. I might pick one up this weekend. Yeah, yeah. I think I mean, we will pick one this up. This weekend. Hey, we'll pick one up. Yeah. So, hey, thank you. Thanks for listening. Don't go changing. Wash your hands. Say no to drugs after you ingest. Right. <laughs> oh, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Again. <laughs> All right. All right. Good night. Chad's waiting to push the button. <laughs> push the fucking button. Push it. God damn it. Push it.